Welcome to Literary AF Podcast. And welcome to the Literary AF Podcast. My name is Sheldon. I'm Danny. And we have some exciting news for you today. It's our very first guest. Uh, oh, no. Nope. Very exciting. It's somebody you've all been asking for. Beyonce Knowles herself. <laughs> Come on, Beyonce. She's a little bit shy. Yeah, she hasn't said anything yet. Come on, just speaking to the mic, Beyonce. Oh, she's leaving. I'm so sorry, you guys. First <laughs> guest since she walked out on us. Hey. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, no, we don't have a guest today. No. I'm sorry. We tried. Uh, and... I have to come clean. Beyonce was not actually in our basement recording with us. <laughs> our cold, dark little basement. Yeah, not yet. Yeah. One day Beyonce will be on the show <laughs> to talk about books for some reason. I'm sure Beyonce reads. I don't know. How busy is she? I'm really busy, I'm sure. Yeah, I don't know if she's has free time for books. <sighs> uh, so anyway, <laughs> we've been getting great fan feedback. Uh, Such as, Sheldon, you say like way too much, and uh, (laughs) your Mm. audio is awful. (laughs) And okay, we think we may have sort of fixed the audio this episode. We're working on it. And I'm going to try not to say like every five seconds. (laughs) But like, (laughs) maybe like, it might happen a little bit. (laughs) Those two were intentional, so they don't count. Yeah. Um. You should get one of those like little clicky counters, and then every time you say like, we'll just oh. keep a tally going. We could turn it into a drinking game where we drink <laughs> milk every time we say it. Right. This is a Christian podcast. We do not drink alcohol here. That's uh, a joke. <laughs> no, it's very serious. Okay, so what are we talking about today, Danny? Today we're going to be talking about The Indifferent Stars Above, which that's, is a book that you read. I that's believe. right. It's by Daniel James Brown. Mm-hmm. It is a historical nonfiction, which everyone knows is my favorite genre. <laughs> uh, wait, I, like nobody knows that it's yeah, not my no. favorite genre, so it's like not really a good joke. Yeah, the joke doesn't work when people don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. I usually read fiction, usually like classic literature. Yeah. This is like a book from 2015, and it's nonfiction. <laughs> but it's still put together like a solid narrative. Mm-hmm. If you are familiar with the Donner Party, the story of the Donner Party... Mm-hmm then you will know what this book is about because it's the story (laughs) of the Donner Party. Yes. Uh, Why don't you give us a quick rundown on who the Donner Party were and uh, I guess what time period this is because it's not a modern piece. Oh, true. Yeah. So if you don't know the story of the Donner Party, um, I don't know if I should plug last podcast on the left, but... They do an excellent couple episodes on the Donner Party. Yeah, there's like three of them, I think. Yeah. They're definitely worth listening to. They're funny and harrowing. (laughs) Harrowing (laughs) is a word I will use tonight more than ever in my entire life when talking about the story. Fill your harrowing Uh, quota. (laughs) But that's like the best word to describe the Donner Party. It's even on the cover (laughs) of the book. Yes, it is. It says the harrowing saga. Um, But so the story of Donner Party is basically a group from the... Mid 1800s, um, they are traveling throughout the United States. They are heading towards California. So this is like the Oregon Trail days. This is like the right. settlers um, and the settlers. It's like before the Wild West. It's oh like, okay. See, um, I didn't know that. Yeah, but it's like shortly before the Wild West. Okay. And John Weston's not going to come save them. <laughs> no, oh. uh, it's like 50 years before that. Okay. And so what they're they're traveling from Illinois, which is. Uh, for non-Americans out there, uh, we're also non-Americans. Yeah, no, so, I have no idea where that is on the map. Uh, it is... In the south? Well, it's south of us, but it's like... <laughs> A lot of things are south of us, though. So. It's kind of by the Great Lakes area. Okay. So it's like mid, mid-east. mid I don't know if... I know there's a Midwest, but I don't think there's a Mid-east. If there's a Mid-east, it's... <laughs> <laughs> you found it. Canadians prove they don't know American geography. Uh, yeah, I, no, so it's yeah. they travel from Illinois all the way across to California. So they're basically traveling across the entire country, right? And uh, along there's it's a long journey. They have to. Um, it's made up of like a whole bunch of pilgrims. So they're like in those covered wagons. They've got like most of them are bringing their families with them of like ten people. There's tons of kids. There's tons of like 
there's some servants and some stuff. There's oxen. There's their cattle and livestock. Um, they've got these huge uh, wagons filled with all of their stuff, like all of their worldly possessions and stuff from the farm and their food and provisions. And they make a few mistakes. And those <laughs> mistakes come back to haunt them in a very, very rough way. Uh, a couple spo- of oopsies. I would say spoiler alert. <laughs> but a good half of this book is them stranded in the mountains in the middle of winter under like 30 feet of snow. Yes. And uh, they don't have any food. <laughs> and so they're forced to eat each other. Rough. That is the... The main thing the Donner Party is known for. Yes. Uh, you may remember the Donner Party from, I believe it's Patch Adams, where Robin Williams goes up to a skeleton and says, Donner Party, table for one, or something like that. <laughs> I've actually never seen that movie. I don't remember if it's good. I just remember that one line. <laughs> That's all you remember. All right. Sure. Uh, but yeah, it is the story, as Daniel James Brown told it, The Indifferent Stars Above, it focuses on... Sarah Graves, who is a 21, I want to say, 21-year-old young woman who is uh, very recently married. So she becomes Sarah Fostick instead of Sarah Graves. Okay. And uh, she's traveling with her family, the Graves family. Um, They're all heading towards California. Her and her new husband are going with them. Um, Along the way, they meet up with uh, James Reed, who is in his family. James Reed is very important in the story. They also meet up with the Donner family themselves, which um, the group is named after the Donner family because after a little incident in the desert, Reed is kicked out of the group and then the Donners are just right. named the leaders of the group. Okay. And uh, I'm trying to remember what other important families there are. I think those are the three main like important families. Yeah. But there's a, there's a few other families in there. Um, yeah, let's see. What's... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Should I just like go into like more of a? I've kind of given like a general summary. Yeah. I... Um. I guess if there's any parts in particular you think that need to be mentioned, uh, like separate from, like the broad picture. Okay. I guess that would work. Well, so the beginning, not half. Um. This book is roughly separated into four parts. Okay. Wait, actually, I think the book is exactly separated into four parts. I shouldn't say <laughs> roughly. The first part is they're leaving their home and. Uh, Illinois, which back then wasn't great. They were basically living in swampland, and the mosquitoes were very bad, and they all had a little disease called malaria, <laughs> and they were they called it, like, the shakes or something, okay. and it basically, like, would overtake them. They would just be, like, violently shaking, and they couldn't do anything because they all had malaria. Just the shakes. And so they didn't like it. In Illinois very much back Those then. are the days where you could just, oh, you know, the shakes. That's yeah. all. <laughs> just came down with the touch of the consumption. Yeah. No, but they, <laughs> so they kind of believe, and they've heard this story about how California is so great, and it's a land developer. Wait, no, it's not. It's a guy who wrote a guidebook, and he's trying to promote this path to California. Okay. Because if his path is successful, then he can sell like a million copies of his guidebook. Right. everyone's going to want to go out there. People want to live in California. The government had recently, or like, as the story's going on, they take the California from Mexico. Okay. Because Mexico used to own California. Right. And so they want Americans there like as soon as possible to like basically claim the land. Okay. And so... There's, like, a lot of incentive for them to go out there. They're trying to, like, basically get as many people as they can to go. Normally what they would do is they would take the Oregon Trail, which is a more tested trail, and but it, Oregon is north of California, so they would go to Oregon and then go south down. But this new trail goes straight to California, so in their minds it's going to save them a lot of miles. However, the trail was pretty untested. It was, like, based off of maps made by fur traders who... Well, they knew the mountains well, and they also weren't carrying around oxen with giant carts. Yeah, you're not hauling an entire family with you. (laughs) Exactly. So for them to traipse through the mountains, it wasn't as big a deal. And uh, they leave. The first part of the book is them just going through Illinois and going through the Midwest. So it's a lot of like the prairies. It kind of, the book sets the stage of like how beautiful and stuff the setting is. Right. The second part of the book is (laughs) where the journey starts to go a little south. Um. 
as they're traveling, as they get past the prairies, they go through the uh, salt desert, which I think is Utah. Um, and Sounds about right. <laughs> it's a desert, <laughs> and they were not prepared for the desert. They uh, they made a few mistakes along the way. Like the book keeps referencing these mistakes they make. Uh, one thing is, and this is one thing I found kind of funny about the book is the author keeps stressing that like they were the people were very afraid of being attacked by groups of natives like cuz this was around the time of like cowboys versus indians like right. and like the indian wars and stuff were still going on in america right and they really stressed that the people were terrified but the author is like but the natives weren't that big of a threat or the people were over exaggerating this threat but then, like, at least four times in the book, they're robbed by natives who, like, steal all their livestock and stuff. So they are a threat. <laughs> so they are a threat. They are so a I don't threat, know for sure. If yep. the author is just, like, trying to be woke, but... Uh, they, they were a threat to the people at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it was... Maybe they weren't as big a threat as the people thought, and maybe... Um, or, like, maybe the people thought all natives were a threat when really it was only, like, certain groups or something. Right. But... Um, so they get robbed, they lose some of their food, they there's a fight in one part where uh James Reed, who's kind of their leader, he kills like a another guy, and the the murder's kind of justified, but at the same time everyone's like, Okay, we need to get this murderer out of here. And at first they're gonna hang him, but then um instead they decide just to exile him, and so he leaves and then his family like, sneaks him out his uh, horse and his gun and, like, some supplies. Right. I remember hearing about this part. Yeah. So then part. James Reed leaves. And uh, after that, they're kind of, like, the graves kind of take control. But the graves, the two main graves men, they aren't, like, really leadership material. Like, one of them's just kind of, like, sickly and weak. Right. And uh, the other one doesn't really know what he's doing. And <laughs> he gets injured right away, which basically makes him... Useless for the entire story. Yeah, he, uh, dead weight. He cuts his hand with an axe and then oh. it inf gets infected and swells up. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the days before medicine and oh, antibiotics. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so after, so you get to the salt desert. Right. I'm, I'm not sure the exact order of things, sorry. But they go through the salt desert and it's rough and it's like 40 miles of them like not having water, not having food. I said like... um <laughs> they, they're trying to get through it apparently the first like few miles go okay mm -hmm. did i say it again you did yeah oh my gosh <laughs> so apparently the first few miles go okay but then they i almost said again they kind of realize <laughs> that it's a desert and that things aren't going well and their oxen are like dying and are getting weak because they don't have water dehydrating yeah yeah and don't have food because there's no grass anywhere. It's a desert. Right. And the ground is made of salt. And yeah. It's gross. Yep. And they eventually make it through the desert. And I think if, I can't remember if anyone dies there, but I think some of their oxen die and some of their cattle get away. Yeah. And uh, their horses are mostly gone by this point. Right. There's a few like little dramas between the group. Um, there's, oh, also, I should mention this before I forget. In the first part of the book, they focus a lot on the fact that they are having some fun. Like, every night, the younger kids will stay... Or, not the younger kids, but the younger adults and younger teens. They'll stay up at night around the campfire, and they'll play the fiddle, and they'll dance. And they're, like, they do have fun together. Right. But then, once they get to about the desert, the fun all stops. <laughs> fun stops, because now everybody's thirsty. Now everyone's thirsty and dying. <laughs> and so they make it through the desert, and they get to the point where... Though, actually, the desert is past the point where they should have turned on the other trail, I believe. Okay. He done goofed? They done goofed. They've know. left the last settlement. <laughs> <laughs> They're in trouble. Right. And then they get to the spot. They get to Truckee Lake, which I think later gets renamed Donner Lake. Okay. And there, they're there. It's in kind of like encircled with mountains. Mm-hmm. Uh, the side they want to get to, they have to cross, I believe it's 45 miles straight through the mountains and snow. Okay. And when they first get there, it's snowing really bad. Like, it's in the middle of a snowstorm. And they try to get through, but they can't with their horses and their... Or not their horses, their oxen and their wagons and stuff. 
And so they end up just making camp by this lake. Do you know what time of year this is roughly? Obviously, it's like getting into winter time yeah, right now. Yeah, it's, but... it's in December because oh, okay. Christmas Day is when uh, they have their first meal of a certain oh, variety. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So they are. <laughs> and the the one warning they got before they leave is they had to leave before, I believe it's May 1st. Okay. Or else they would get stranded in the uh, mountains over like winter time. Yep. And these mountains get a ton of snow. Like the author was saying, based on like the tree patterns, they expected that they at least got 22 feet of snow. Wow. Because that's how high the trees have been cut off. Yeah. So 22 Oof. feet. That is, uh, that's like six of you stacked on top of it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no. That is implying that you are only three feet tall. <laughs> it's uh, four of me and then like some leg. Four and a half of you. Uh, five. Four and a quarter. Yeah, yeah, but four and a quarter. Okay. Four and a quarter of me. Yeah. And then, yeah, when they get to the mountain, <laughs> they... <laughs> Graves, he's Sarah's dad. Yep. A lot of the book is told through Sarah's perspective. Right. Uh, Sarah's dad, he decides to make snowshoes out of the uh, ox's, the things that go around their neck, the yoke or whatever. Okay. And to split the, just if you split one of those things in two, you can make two snowshoes roughly from it. Okay. And so they make 15 snowshoes or 15 pairs of snowshoes. Okay. And then that is, creates what's called the snowshoe party. Also known as the Forlorn Hope, I think right. is what they call ourselves, yep. or they're later called. <laughs> Don't call yourselves the Forlorn Hope when you're going out for help. <laughs> it's only going to go bad. You got to stay positive when you're in a dire situation. Yeah, they. Uh, well, so the the main group they make camps. They make these little cabins by the lake, and it doesn't go super well. Right. Uh, I'm not sure if this is. I think this is before anyone has been eaten. <laughs> uh, the group, they're going through the mountains. It's not going good. Okay. Uh, they're making very slow progress. Uh, their clothes are basically disintegrating because they've been walking through these clothes for like eight months at this point. Ugh. So their shoes are nothing. Right. Their jackets and their... They weren't even dressed for winter, really, when they left because they left in May. Right. And like the stuff they're wearing is kind of falling apart. Uh, they meet, I don't know who was all in the snowshoe party, there's 15 people. Uh, some of them have to turn around like immediately because they are not prepared for the mountains. Uh, they also get two native guides named uh, Luis and Salvador. Okay. Uh, they're important because they're, their ending is very sad. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I remember the names from from the podcast that we yeah. were listening to. Yeah. Uh, they... There's one part where they... So they've been traveling now for a few days in the mountains. Right. And all they had with them were some, like, like basically beef jerky made from the ox. Okay. But the oxen had also been, like, walking for miles and miles and miles and didn't have any food. Right. And they didn't kill the oxen right away at the camp. So the oxen... Had starved. Were basically starving. So their meat didn't have a lot of nutrients yes. in it. And had almost no fat in it. Right. So it's like... Just chewing on leather. Yeah, it's like pure, it's not even pure protein, it's just like, a lot of it's, yeah, leather is a good yeah, word for leather. it. leather. So, this is, at this point, they're kind of out of food, they are getting hungry, they're making very slow progress, mm -hmm. uh, and then this paragraph just, oh, it was haunting. Sometime that afternoon, they made a catastrophic mistake. As they left the western end of Six Mile Valley, they approached a low ridge to the northwest. If they had climbed it, they would have found themselves precisely where they needed to be, on the established immigrant road at Emigrant Gap, at the point where it drops some 700 feet into Bear Valley. From there, they would have had a rel relatively easy, gradual descent to Johnson's Ranch. That's the nearby settlement that they're right. trying to head towards. Right. But the ridge screened their view of Bear Valley, and, is said, and instead of ascending it, they turned left to the oh. south skirting the ridge and beginning to follow terrain that led inexorably and invitingly downhill. Right. So instead of going, if they had 
a better lay of the land if they their guides didn't know the area in winter because nobody was crossing this path in the winter time. Right. It was insane. So they didn't know what they were really looking for. And with everything changed from all the snow, they didn't know the landmarks and all that stuff. Right. So they missed the gap they were supposed to walk down, which would have saved their lives. Yeah. And it's right after this mistake that things go really badly. <laughs> For the forlorn hope or for everybody? Uh, for them, but then as an effect, everybody. Okay. Because these guys were the ones who were looking to gain help. They were the rescue party. Uh, yeah, they were trying to they were trying to find out rescuers right. for the rest of the group. Right, right. Uh, eventually, so this <laughs> is... Okay, I think this is on the morning of December 23rd, which is their eighth day out. Okay. And this is, uh, I think... Three or four days after they had run out of food. Yep. Um, somebody suggested that they kill someone and eat their flesh. Like, they turned to cannibalism pretty early, considering the fact that you can actually live for a few weeks without eating. Uh, it's, it's the rules of three. Three weeks without food, three days without water, three minutes without air. And three seconds without love. Please no. make an RT. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Just a Twitter humor. Uh, well, so, yeah. So they only asked, like, four days without food, and then somebody's already suggesting cannibalism. Right. But Just, I guess... You know. <laughs> I'm not going to judge them. Uh, the crazy thing is, though, is Patrick Dolan, he's one of the... I think he was a single man with the group, and the single men in the story get destroyed by the winter. <laughs> I don't know. The book, like, speculates on why men had a harder time, and they think it's... Partly because, uh, like, male body chemistry or whatever, like, our our heat tends... Like, the way our bodies trap heat is differently between right. male and female. Right. And, like, female bodies trap heat closer to the internal organs, but men tend to have, like, warmer skin and, like... Okay. I don't know really why that is, but um, that's one of the reasons why they think the men were dying of hypothermia a lot faster than the women. Right. Uh, something, like, about body fat and the way our bodies store fat differently. Okay. Um, there's also just the idea of like the families had people taking care of them, but the single men were really like they're on their own. Yeah, they're they're on. The and so yeah. the single men on the trip also tend to make the boldest and worst choices. <laughs> and Patrick Dolan, he's the one who suggests that they Cannibalize like draw strips, cast lots, basically, okay. to decide who's going to be eaten first. Right. He forces the issue. Uh, they all take their strips, and so it's like Sarah and her sister Mary, they're watching their father, and Sarah's watching her husband Jay uh, take all these strips. But then Patrick Dolan is the one who draws the <laughs> the white guy who suggested it. Right. He's the one who draws the strip that right. says, oh, we're going to kill you and eat you. Right. Um, Did he change his mind about that? They all changed their mind. They decided ah. not to kill him. Right. But <laughs> the idea that he was faced with his mortality like that Drives him insane. Like, right. within two days, he has lost his mind. Really? And he essentially kills himself in the snow. Like, these, the whole group, they go kind of like... Uh, they get snow madness. Right, right. <laughs> well, a lot of them get snow blindness, which right. is a real thing. Yes. And then they also get snow madness, which is a thing I just invented. <laughs> but they get hypothermia really bad. They really lose control, like, of their bearings. Yeah. They walk out into the snow, they strip down, they do the whole, like, yeah, the book really goes into the effects of hypothermia and the hy hypothermia on your brain and, like, how it makes yeah. you foolish things. You eventually start to feel like you're getting really hot and yeah. you just start undressing and in the middle of this winter storm. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, like, it does a few things to your mind. And they are, oh, actually, that is one of the reasons why they turned to cannibalism so soon is because the author thinks... They probably didn't recognize the signs of hypothermia right. and had just thought that they were, like, dying from starvation. Right. So in their minds, they're like, oh, we're going to die right away because we're so hungry. <laughs> when really it's like, oh, no, you're dying because you're you are really, freezing really cold. to death yeah. and you're not wearing shoes. <laughs> yeah. Like, a lot of them had, like, because their shoes were so disintegrated, they are like, bare feet in snowshoes. Ugh, that's awful. Yeah. And, uh... I get snow yeah. in my boots and I'm whining about it for hours. <laughs> Well, just whatever you do, don't get trapped in the mountains for an entire winter. Oh, I would just give up, like, immediately. I'd be in the snow for 20 minutes, and then I'd just lie down and accept my fate. That's... I'm not even going to try to fight it. 
I I don't know what I would do, but I feel like I feel like I would have maybe headed back a little ways right. and like died in the desert instead. <laughs> I think it's a hard choice. <laughs> I guess I would have rather rather died in the snow. Well, the thing is, like, if it's storming, the wind is covering up all your tracks and stuff. So turning around, and going back, isn't really an option after a certain point. That's true, and I guess especially if you're like. If you've already walked thousands of miles and you're like forty five miles away from where you want to be, oh, yeah, you're not like, gonna. Turn the idea around. of turning back would be ridiculous, yeah. especially after you've lost your oxen <laughs> and your. Oh man, but yeah, so there's there's a lot going on in this book. There's a lot of details that really stuck out to me, and a lot of sort parts that were just like, oh, this is heartbreaking. This is so scary. I would don't know what I would do in this situation. Right. I really recommend this book. Um, there's. A couple things I didn't like about it, if uh, we want to get into yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The one thing that really stood out to me is, like, so the main story is compelling, and it's so, like, uh, intriguing, and I, like, I'm just, like, uh, enraptured by it. Right. And I wanted to read more and more, and I was just absorbing this story of these people, and just as it was getting exciting, all of a sudden the author would go, you see, normally the snowfall in this region is about blah blah blah. blah. And you're like, oh, okay. Or derails and kills the flow. He does. He's he's constantly trying to provide context and background for the situation, right. which is good for a historical book. Right. But at the same time, you get into the narrative flow, and then you're just interrupted by. Meanwhile, in California, the governor had decided that blah blah. blah. Just, <laughs> oh, please right. skip this part. Yeah. And. That really bothered me because it would throw off the pace or I'd be really into it and then all of a sudden this would come in and oh, <laughs> I would just kind of lose total, uh, yeah. Right. Uh, another thing too is, so they follow Sarah, which is an interesting choice that they chose Sarah. Why Specifically. That? She's one of the first ones out. So she's one of the snowshoers and she's one of the few that actually live. Oh, okay. But then there's so much story that happens after Sarah's been rescued. At the camp. Yeah. 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 And also yeah. all the rescue parties that go back to the camp. Right. So in the, on the one hand, it's like your main character is rescued two-thirds of the way through the book. Right. And then it's like, well, what happens after that? Do and they just tell it? Does he tell the story like from a different point of view? Or? No, it's more just from a like a third person oh, just perspective, like a, a just a general. All right. Here's what happens, but okay. it would be a good comparison would be like if you're watching Star Wars and Luke Skywalker finishes his conflict at the two thirds mark, and then the rest of the movie is just like, oh well, here's some guys fighting. <laughs> <laughs> just it wouldn't be as exciting. Right. Uh, any other questions? Um. Well, I can't ask, but I guess, do you have a favorite character in the whole story, I guess? Maybe James Reed. James, James Reed. Reed is the g guy who was in charge. He gets exiled after the murder. Oh, right. And then he's the leader of the first rescue party yes. to come find them because he goes to the, he goes to the place where he's supposed to go. Yeah. And waits for them there. Like he gets to California. Yeah, while because he's traveling in the alone. So he's on a horse. He doesn't have as much stuff to carry. He doesn't have people slowing him down. He can just go fast. Right. So he gets through the mountains before the snowfall. And or he might even take another route. Yeah. I I don't remember, but he gets there before them. And then his wife and kids aren't there. None of the other ones have arrived. And he starts to realize that things have gone really bad. Right. He tries to get help, but the army won't help him. Because they're in the middle of a war. So he says, okay, well, if I go and fight this war for you and we win, can I take soldiers back and save my family? Right. And so that's what he does. And he does win his battle. Perfect. So he's just this random hero, comes and saves the day, then is like, okay, I need you guys to come back and help me save these people. Uh, he When he shows up, it's so exciting. Like, it's, it generally feels this heroic moment. Right. And... Yeah, he's, uh, James Reed is great. It's interesting that this book is written, like, from Sarah's point of view. Well, it's, like, uh, recounting a historic event. Because usually you don't get those in, like, a, a character's narrative. You just get facts laid out. Do you think that this works as far as, like, telling a story 
like this goes? Yeah, other than other than the ending of her being basically done before everybody else. Right. It does work really well and it makes it into more of a narrative than just a historical retelling. Yeah. And so that really worked for me. Okay. Um, we are coming to an end of our time. We're okay. a little over time. Okay. Uh, should we do plugs maybe? Sure. I got uh, I got lots of plugs today. Um, Can you get plug in? First plug, uh, we're on iTunes now. Uh, Literary AF. We're also on Spotify. Uh, you can also find us on Podbean, a Literary AF. And we're also on YouTube. So we have all your bases covered as far as listening goes. Find us wherever. Um, our Gmail, literaryafpod at gmail.com. You can send us uh, messages of any sort. Uh, and our Twitter, literaryafpod on Twitter. Yeah, so please don't send us any emails that are mean <laughs> or uh, or too nice. Just keep it in the middle. Just keep it very neutral. Solid neutral zone. Uh, you can also hit us up on Patreon at... Uh, we don't have a Patreon. We don't have a Patreon. We don't have okay. Patreon, no. uh, Send us cash directly. <laughs> uh, throw a couple loonies in an envelope. <laughs> Stick it in the mail. <laughs> right, shell them on the cover. They'll know what to do with it. <laughs> They'll find it. You know, my art teacher told me once that you used to be able to send a letter to uh, Salvador Dali just by, like, drawing a picture of his mustache on the envelope. Really? I don't know how true that actually is, but that's what my teacher told me, so I take it as fact. Hmm. I wonder if you could mail prints by just drawing that symbol on an envelope. Well, you can't anymore because he's dead. I wonder if you could <laughs> send it to the afterlife. I think you're supposed to burn it when you do that. You, you write the letter and then you burn it. Do like a circle of salt and burn the letter. <laughs> summon <laughs> prints. Do you think we could summon prints? Uh, Get him living in this house with us? Only if he pays rent. Uh, yeah, so that is today's episode. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in and listening. Thank you very much. And uh, be back next week for a special episode where we finally get Beyonce Knowles. I don't All think right. she's going to come. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.